Um, there is supposed to be a difference between a graduate course and an undergraduate course. Don't tell anybody. There is no difference in this course. Okay? Um, the requirements are the same. But don't tell anybody. We're putting it on videotape and YouTube so the whole world will know. But I'll deal with the undergraduate and graduate committees when they complain. I'm old enough they can complain all they want. I got tenure, so who cares? <laughs> okay. Um, the course started out essentially in my area as my specialty course in welding as a graduate course. And Chris Hsu, when he was head of the, he's now head of the department, but 10 or 15 years ago when he was head of the graduate committee, uh, he came to me and said, why don't you broaden it? And so we turned it into a structural materials course. And you'll see there are some structural material modules. And then um, for a while, it, it started becoming an online course. In fact, starting in the early 90s, I videotaped the course as an experiment for distance learning for MIT. And in fact, it was the first, my course was the first time ever, MIT ever gave credit at a distance to students that weren't on campus. That was in like 1991. And I learned that first year, videotaping the courses was a great idea because if you can't make it to a class and you're asking that question, then you can watch the movie, okay? And so for the last 25 years, I've been paying to videotape my classes. MIT won't help me, okay? I do it because it makes it easier for me, makes it easier for you, and Giancarlo makes money. Okay, as a graduate student. He's a starving graduate student. And other students do too, uh, different years. Um, Brian Homan in the back was a graduate student with me. He used to videotape as a graduate student. Now he's been a practicing engineer for 10 years and he will be one of the lecturers. Because we have, we turn it into a modular course format. Um, I've gotten to the point in life where I just, I don't, I don't want to worry about what I teach. I just want to come and interact with the students and, and tell stories, OK? One, one of my postdocs cataloged that over a four-year period, I told, told 453 stories, OK, in my classes, OK? Uh, the stories are not just for fun. Most of them have some sort of purpose to them. And I think most students get that. A few students, I've had one or two students evaluate the course, and oh, why do you tell these stories? And other students say they like the stories. My favorite evaluation was the student who used to say that he watched the videos while he's fixing dinner, okay? Uh, so um, one of the purposes of the course is to give you some experience in more of a real world setting, okay? Um, in my welding course, I used to say I'm going to, I'm going to solve one differential equation just to prove I'm an MIT professor, okay? Uh, I never do a derivation in class. Does anyone know why professors spend a whole hour doing a derivation in class and making mistakes? Yes? Because they didn't prepare a lecture. Have you heard that before from me? Okay, yeah. Well, I learned it in my first or my second year as a faculty member. I'd been on a trip and I had to le lecture in the course that was 337. This was back in the mid-1970s. And I hadn't prepared the lecture. And I looked in the book and there was a derivation. I thought, oh, I can waste the time by doing this derivation. And all of a sudden a light went off. I thought, oh, that's why they waste our time doing derivations in class. And I promised myself that I would never do another derivation after that class. And I have not, okay, for over 40 years. Because it's a waste of time, okay? And that's what they're doing. They're just wasting time, filling up the time. I would rather answer your questions and fill up the time rather than do a lecture. Now, the problem with that is if you were undergraduates and I was still teaching thermo, I would have to prepare you for the quiz. Like if the quiz is in two days and I haven't covered one of the topics that I already wrote the questions for, it doesn't matter. If you ask a question, I'm going to ignore you and I'm going to lecture so that everybody gets what they need for the quiz, right? 
and I realized that's stupid too. Okay, that's not teaching, that's prepping for quizzes, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the way we teach in general is garbage, and I've been teaching my own way ever since. Um, so there's three lectures I will teach between six and ten live times this year. Dr. Simone Belmar, who is a graduate of this department, um, and is a mechanical engineer as an undergraduate and got a doctoral degree in fatigue and fracture um, and is a practicing engineer starting his own company is going to, we'll talk about what he's going to talk about, actually part of talk, starting a company. And Brian Holman, who was my last doctoral student who worked on non-destructive testing for his doctoral thesis is going to talk about non-destructive testing. And Brian will be the TA. <coughs> And I guess I should have put on here Jerry Hills, my assistant. And so if you have questions, you can talk to her. So let's go. What's it doing? <clears throat> oh. Oh. Oh, well. Why doesn't it want to index? Hmm. Okay, whatever, he didn't like the old mode. Uh-oh. Well, who cares? Um, so this, there's a sign-in sheet that I passed around. That's what I will go off of, of who's in class. And Jerry's my assistant right down here on 4138 down the hall. It became an online class, and the problem because I videotaped it, a lot of students would have the same problem you got. They can't make some of the 9 o'clock classes. Well, no one likes to come to 9 o'clock classes. And as it gets to we end daylight savings time, nobody wants to get up for a 9 o'clock class. So you're going to see that I'm going to, I'm going to schedule all the lectures during the month of September. But you only have to attend six lectures out of the whole month. Okay? And we're going to finish up most of the work by November. So when all your other courses are starting to pile on the work at the end of the semester, you're going to essentially be done with this course. Okay? So um, it became an online course, and I couldn't really tell who was in the class. We got to the point where we didn't even have a lot of people listening to the lectures. I had guest lectures. It was a little bit of embarrassment. Okay? Um, so now you have to come to six lectures. And we will keep attendance, okay? And last semester, about two or three students ended up dropping the course at the end because they were like five lectures behind in attending lectures, okay? I don't know if they did other things, but you know, it's not that hard to attend a few lectures, okay? Um, they'll be flexibly scheduled, and I don't care which lecture or recitation you attend because we all sort of tell stories in case studies. And it doesn't really matter. You're not going to be quizzed. You're going to find out. OK? Um, and we will schedule some for those of you, if there is anybody. Who, cannot, who thinks they couldn't make six during the month of September, 9 o'clock lectures? So we may not have to do it. But even so, you're going to be watching other videos that, from lectures of previous years. And in October and November, we will schedule a couple of classes just for recitations. So you can come and ask us questions, OK? So I'm not just going to dump you at the end of September, but we're going to videotape things at the beginning, and then you get to watch the, the movies later. Um, class schedule will be arranged. Well, if you look on the, we'll get to, that's at the end of this. I put it in. Um, because of travel schedules of all the three of us, uh, this is my only lecture this week, but I'll do two next week and three the next week. You'll see the schedule. And it's also on Stellar, okay? Normal lecture time is 9 to 10. Sometimes we might have one at 10 a.m., but if all of you can make this 9 o'clock time for six lectures, we don't even have to do that. But we did that last year. You are going to have to write a paper. It re the Institute requires me to grade each of you individually, which means you have to do some individual work, okay? Uh, 
But the theme is flexibility in a stress-free environment, and um, somehow I got into a mode. But anyway, I try to be flexible and take away the stress. You don't need stress as seniors and graduate students, okay? Particularly as a graduate student. I remember as a graduate student, I was so sick of taking quizzes. I mean, what did I need to take a quiz for? What was I proving at that point? I was already in graduate school, okay? I didn't need to take quizzes. I learned to take quizzes throughout my life, okay? There are a bunch of modules. I wish I knew how to toggle this back. There's a button right up there. Yeah, but the that's not on my screen. I know. That's the one I hit before. Maybe if I go to the top. Uh, yeah, you mean down at the bottom? The mask should appear on. Yeah, there it is. Oh, where? Oh, I did it on the side? The mask, it's not, it's, nothing's appearing on this screen. Just look, you have to look up there. Oh, oh, it, oh, okay, hey, good. No, not that one. Which one? This one? Thank you, I'm glad you, you know how to do this. <laughs> you're, you're younger than I am, so you know how. Okay, uh, the available modules, if you go to eager.mit.edu, you'll see some of the modules, if I go backwards, I've done what is total quality management. I'm officially a professor of uh, engineering materials and engineering management. And I actually took some courses at Sloan. They consider me an alum, an alum for fundraising purposes. Material selection, welding, metallurgy, solid state welding. I do those during the summer when I have US Navy students here. Um, what is engineering at one time in 2015? I'd always wondered. What's the difference between a scientist and an engineer? So I did an experiment. I taught 12, 12 lectures on engineering, and I came up with a list of what is the difference between a scientist and an engineer. If you want, we could go through that sometime. Codes and standards, I've taught it twice, but um, I actually think it's an important course, but the students don't care for it much. Um, they think it's kind of dull, but I, I deal with it all the time. Deformation processing, which is rolling, forging, um, uh, uh, and things like that, drawing of sheet metal, materials processing, casting, materials selection and economics, which is different than the material selection. And then if you go to what Dr. Belmar has taught in the years, uh, materials processing, structural materials, remember he's a structural mechanical behavior type of person, um, structural life assessment. So there's, there's all kinds of modules, and most of them are about six units six classes, six, six lectures. There's also Neil Jenkins, who was one of my students who went off after his PhD and got an MD one time when I was on sabbatical. He did um, a dozen lectures on how a medical doctor examines you. When you walk in, he uses all five senses. He smells, and if you got garlic breath, that may be a certain type of disease, okay? Uh, so they, they, they touch and they feel and all this other stuff. He goes through, if you're interested in medicine, it's sort of a, a material scientist view of the medical profession and, and how general practitioners examine, okay? And then Steve Lyons is a graduate of Sloan. He's a practicing attorney. He has his own law firm in Boston. Uh, I've known him for about seven or eight years, and he's argued between the, in front of the Supreme Court four or five times. Okay, he's a patent attorney. He thinks that students should learn intellectual property. So every spring, MIT, again, they will not support him. They will, uh, but he comes over on his own. He also has bagels on Fridays, okay, that he brings at his own expense. He just enjoys interacting with the students. And so the students have loved his modules on law and technology, which is basically intellectual property. So if you want to start a business or if you think you're going to invent something, it's a worthwhile module. And it's actually a double module in that it's 12 lectures. What do you have to do? You have to watch 36 lectures. If you go look at any other 12 unit course, there's about 36 lectures. So you can take six six unit modules, you can take three 12 unit modules, you can take whatever combination as long as it 
turns out that you either attend or watch 36 lectures. You can mix and match any way you want, even between modules, although I don't know how that, well, actually, the way I, I'm just telling stories, <laughs> problem is you might hear the same story twice. But anyway, um, you see if the answer is the same at the end of the story, right? Um, prepare a one-page outline of each lecture or module. Why, you, why do you do that? Um, a professor can only get one or two ideas across in a one-hour lecture, okay? They might hit 15 different topics, but there's really just one or two themes. And what happened to me, as a junior, for whatever reason, I took an elective in the physics department called Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. And I had Vera Kistiakowsky, okay? Now, Vera was the, one of the, I think she might have been the first woman full professor in physics at MIT. And her father had won the Nobel Prize at Harvard in chemistry. And Vera was a wonderful lecturer, but I didn't have a clue what was going on in that class. I was getting 15 or 20 out of 100 on the homeworks when everybody else was averaging 85. I didn't have a clue. And so the night before the final, I figured, I'm going to flunk this stupid course. I'm just going to go through the textbook, I'm going to pick out the high points, and I'll go in there and do whatever I do. Well, I went in, I finished the three-hour final in an hour and 20 minutes, checked it over in another 20 minutes, walked out and got an A in the course. And all of a sudden, a big light went off. You mean all that stuff they talk about in class is just fluff? Okay? There's only one or two themes, and if you can figure out the theme, then you know what the lecture is all about. And so for the rest of my career at MIT, from first term, or that was first term junior year, all the way through graduate school, I never took another note in class. OK? I didn't worry about quizzes. I just, at the end of the class, I'd say, can I write down in one or two sentences what this lecture was all about? Can I summarize it? And I found that's a very valuable thing, not just in taking lectures, but going into a meeting and afterwards saying, what was this meeting all about? And for sometimes your answer is nothing. It was a waste of time in that meeting, okay? But nonetheless, um, you kind of, I read things and I say, okay, can I summarize it? So I basically want you, as part of this class, to learn how to summarize one hour of talking into a sentence or two. So you're going to watch 36 lectures, and it'll probably end up being about three pages long at the end of the semester. After every lecture, write down what you think that lecture was about. And I've, I tell you that one of the things I've learned from this, if you write down, if you watch a lecture and you write down what you think it's about, and he watches the same lecture and writes it, they're not similar at all. <laughs> because each of you, the important thing you get out of the lecture is related to your prior experience, okay? So you, but that's, that's okay. You're internalizing what the lecture is about, and that's the purpose of that exercise. Not a lot of work. You've got to watch the lecture anyway. It takes you two minutes at the end to write it down, put it on your computer, and at the end you're going to have to submit. It's... Some students do big, long things. I don't want a big, long thing. I have to review it, or Brian has to review it, OK? Um, just keep it simple, OK? Um, you don't have to figure out what this lecture is about, because it doesn't really have a theme, um, other than what's required. So a one-page outline uh, on the 36, well, a two or three line for all 36 lectures and what the two or three themes for that one lecture. Prepare a 10-page paper on a materials topic of your choice. We're going to go into that in some detail. Review, but don't edit. Just like you were review, reviewing a technical publication, review it and say, well, I think you have not proven X. Can you elaborate? Okay, You don't have to rewrite it for them. That's not your job as an editor of a paper that's been submitted to a journal. You just critique it and say, you need to strengthen this point, or this is extraneous, get rid of this figure, you know, whatever, or put in such and such a figure. 
So you, we're going to assign you at the beginning of November um, uh, three or four papers, or no, you're going to be assigned a paper, and three or four students are going to review each one of your papers. Okay, each one of you have three or four other students in the class. And that's one of the reasons, one of the things you're going to have to do, if I didn't say it already, is you're going to have to tell us what your topics are by, uh, it'll get there when we, uh, within the, by the end of this month, actually sooner than that. Ten pages maximum. I don't want big, long papers. I'm not trying to get a 30-page paper. If you actually think about it, you only need to spend about 10, 10 hours putting this paper together. And if you pick a topic you already know, uh, some people, didn't you, didn't you pick a topic that was your thesis? Not thesis, but the previous project that I worked on. Okay, so you'd worked on it previously. Uh, one of the ones I really liked a few years ago, I actually had two students who were pole vaulters in the class, and they, they did papers on how you design a pole vault pole, which is really interesting, actually, by the way. Um, and I want sources, okay? I don't want how the automotive company builds cars. It's a little broad, okay? Um, I want something that, could, like the pole vaulting pole was perfect. How do you design a fiberglass pole vault pole that has different stiffnesses along the leak length? And you know how they, anybody know how you do it? Instead of rolling up the fiberglass in a jelly roll like this, you roll it on the, like this, from a corner. And if you think about it, you got more layers in the middle than you do on the ends, which is exactly what you want in the stiffness of a pole vault pole. Okay, and you see these poles bending 180, more than 180 degrees? It's because they're really strong, flexible fiberglass with many layers in the middle. Not particularly magic or rocket science, but it's basically just how you lay up something, which I thought was interesting. I'd never thought about it before. Okay, um, example topics can be Japanese swordsmithing. Uh, some students were interested and they, used, they, had, they actually made their own swords, not as part of this course. But it was something they were doing with Mike Tarkanian. Um, someone was interested in the material and why the Titanic broke up, which is a brittle fracture. Some people are nuclear engineers and they were interested in some of the materials in nuclear power plants. You got to focus that down a little bit more because there's a lot of materials in nuclear power plants. Materials for pole vaulting, I already talked about that. Your paper's best if you pick a topic that you're interested in. One student did a few years ago ancient, not ancient, but antique doorknobs. If you go to Europe and you look at a 500 or 800 year old building, there'll be these ornate, cast, and wrought doorknobs, okay? And they were just, for whatever reason, they were interested in that. And so they did a paper on doorknobs, okay? I don't care. I mean, I like to, to read about these things, okay? Um, so any material topic you wish, uh, 10 pages, double-spaced, don't be too general, don't be too broad, don't try to cover too much, add your own analysis and opinions, okay? I'm interested in what you think. You don't have to be right, but I want to know what you think about things. So the requirements are the course. Here we go, summarized A through F. No quizzes, no finals, okay? Submission of a proposed paper topic. You got 12 days. I want to know what your paper topics are. If you say you're going to talk about designing of automobiles, I'm going to reject it as too broad, okay? If you say you want to talk about designing of a carbon fiber automobile like the BMW i3, probably still pretty broad, but a student did it and did a great job on it, but it's partly because they had been studying it for some time. And they did a great job because it wasn't something they just did 10 hours on. They probably had done 30 hours before, and they talked about something they were interested in. Okay, that's fine. Um, no issue of collusion. So this whole integrity thing that I'm supposed to tell you about, I told you about it. Uh, you can go to the integrity at MIT, and it'll talk to you about don't plagiarize, don't cheat. How can you cheat if there's no quizzes? Okay, I kind of took that away, right? Um, 
there's no issue of collusion. You can talk to each other, okay? Um, uh, you'll be evaluated on your paper. Your paper is due November 1st in final form, okay? Final form meaning it's going to go to three or four other people to review. Just before Thanksgiving, they're going to have marked it up. You can use Microsoft Word in edit mode or whatever and make comments about, I didn't understand this sentence or this paragraph or elaborate here or cut this out or whatever. You know, you, you're going to have to, and then give that back to the student. Those edits are not coming to, to Brian or myself. Those are going to the other students that are reading your paper. Okay. Um, your final papers are going to be due on 12-6, which means you take those comments and you get to spend Thanksgiving editing those and turning them in. I mean, you actually, you have about two weeks. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's actually before the last day of class. When is everything due? It's due on the last day of class, but again, I'm trying to get you done with this course. And really, if you've done your paper and watched your modules by November 1st, not a whole lot to do in November and early December, okay? Uh, completion of one-page outlines, that's due when you finish watching the modules, hopefully by December 6th. And attend six live lectures, okay? That's it. Any problems? Okay, I've now done that. We also have, well, Many students say they learn a lot from reading the other students' papers. I learn a lot from reading the students' papers. That's one of the things that makes the class enjoyable. It's where I get some of my stories sometimes, okay? So I'll now talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy. Um, too much of our educational approach is geared towards helping students take tests. And the way I learned this, I tend to get up about 4.30 in the morning and I usually dress in the dark and I go downstairs and I can turn the kitchen light on and I don't have to eat in the dark. But one time, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was sitting there eating my cereal or whatever at the kitchen table and one of my children left their high school math book on the table. And so I thought, okay, well, the paper hadn't come yet or whatever. And I started flipping through the math book. That math book had two pages on exponentials two pages on differentials, two pages on integration, two pages on factorials. I had no idea that mathematics came in two-page lumps, okay, increments. And I thought, all they're doing is prepping them to take the SAT, okay? They're not teaching them math, okay? They're prepping them to answer a few as you know today, relatively simple questions. They didn't seem relatively simple to you when you were taking the SAT, but they, they weren't really getting into the depth of things. And I, I thought, that's stupid, okay? And then I started thinking about, well, we do the same thing at MIT, just in a different form. And we put a lot of pressure on the students for the quizzes. Why are we doing that? You wouldn't be here if you didn't know how to take quizzes. You wouldn't have been admitted, okay? Um, the other thing is this course is not required for anything. Seniors, yeah, you got to get a grade, but no one's really been that disappointed in the grade. Although I'll tell you, now that I require attendance at some of the lectures, there have been some students that didn't get the grade they had hoped for. But it wasn't that they weren't told you're going to actually have some requirements. And I will. Brian and I will hold you to the retirement. Brian is a real stickler for some of these things. Anyway, um, but I'm trying to do it in a stress-free environment because I remember what it was like to be an MIT student, um, and you don't need that stress. 95% of the stress at MIT, whether you're a faculty member or a student, is self-inflicted. You put the pressure on yourself. That's not all bad, necessarily. And in fact, there are a number of articles, if you're looking for some things to read, uh, aside from watching my stories, uh, on Stellar, there's an MIT faculty newsletter that I wrote back, boy, this was 2004, so 15 years ago, on what is the essence of MIT. Now, I wrote this after I'd been here nearly 40 years. 
as a student and as a faculty member. And I came up with five things that make MIT unique from all other schools except maybe Caltech. Okay? But Caltech is just a spin-off. You guys know that, right? Does anybody know that story? So what happened is there's a guy named Arthur Amos Noyes, who was one of the greatest physical chemists in the United States. He had been head of the MIT chemistry department. He had studied in Germany, because back then, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, every, all the great scientists had to go to Germany to study science. That's where all the quantum mechanics gurus were and stuff. In fact, MIT, if you look at the MIT curriculum from the 1880s and 1890s, you were required to take German, because the language of science and all the important papers were written in German. Okay, So Noyes had gone to Germany. He came back. He was the greatest physical chemist, and he became president of MIT. And um, it turns out there was another guy called Walker, William Walker. You ever heard of Walker Memorial over here? Okay, William Walker, sort of along with another guy called Arthur D. Little, which you probably haven't heard of too much anymore, but... He, Arthur D. Little in the 1880s graduated from MIT and founded a big consulting firm, uh, sort of like McKinsey or something, called Arthur D. Little. Okay, and Arthur D. Little and William Walker helped start what's called the Chemical Engineering Practice School and defined the whole field of chemical engineering. And the practice school, anybody know what the practice school is in chemical engineering? It's been going for over 100 years. It's one of the real innovations in MIT education. They take teams of master's students and send them to company sites for like six weeks at a time to solve a problem as a team. And after they've done this for uh, a whole year, they bring them back and turn them into PhD students. Uh, but um, the Chemical Engineering Practice School is a great experience builder. And you actually have a faculty member who lives on site you know, in Texas or wherever, some oil company or whatever, with you. Now they do pharmaceutical companies and other things. But Walker believed that education should involve real practice. In that sense, he and William Barton Rogers, who founded MIT, believed mens et manus, okay? Mind and hand. You have to get in there and do things, okay? Uh, but Noyes thought, no. You should be a pure academic, okay? But, and I quote in the beginning here from a guy named uh, Edison. December 1911, Thomas Edison wrote, there is no question but that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is the best technical school in the country. I have found the graduates of tech to have a better, more practical, more usable knowledge as a class than the graduates of any other school in the country. The salvation of America lies in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Woo! Okay. Uh, so you can, hopefully that'll encourage you to read some more of that article uh, about what makes MIT unique. Well, it turns out they had a big war between Noyes and Walker. And Walker won, and the faculty decided we need to have practical education. So Noyes left MIT. He stopped in Cleveland along the way, or maybe Chicago, and met a guy named Millikan. Anyone ever heard of Millikan? The oil drop experiment, second Nobel Prize in physics in the United States. And the two of them went out to Pasadena, California, and they took over this little school called Throop Institute of Technology. They renamed it Caltech. And what's the mascot of Caltech? It's a beaver. What are the colors of Caltech? Maroon and gray. Does it sound familiar? Or, you know what we used to call maroon and gray? Blood on concrete. Okay. Um, but anyway, hey, you know, each, each class has its own. Anyway, the stress that we feel around here is self-inflicted. Good teaching, on the other hand, makes things simple rather than complex. How many professors actually get up and sort of pontificate and try to explain to you how complex the subject is? 
That's bullshit. I'm sorry, that's bullshit. If they really understand it, they should be able to simplify it so that you can understand it. You're not that dumb, okay? You're actually in the top, on the order of one out of 10,000 academically in the country. So they ought to be able to teach it to you. Okay, um, so my philosophy is I wanna try to teach you what you already know just how to put it together. I think all those years as an undergraduate or as an um, undergraduate somewhere else and now a graduate student, you've learned all the tools. You know what uh, fixed law of diffusion is or Fourier's first law or something like that, but they never tell you how to use it. I used to say when I taught thermo, MIT students can calculate the heat engine up one side down the other, but they can't tell you how an air conditioner works. Okay? Well, an air conditioner, by the way, is a heat engine. Okay? Um, and if you really understand an air conditioner, you understand why the big ones are expensive because they have a smaller delta T between the heat exchanger, and it all comes out of the efficiency of a heat exchanger, a heat engine. Okay? But they never teach you that because they're just prepping you for an exam. Um, so anyway, the syllabus, you, if you go on the web, and actually we sent to those pre-registered a copy of a letter that I wrote that basically says what we have. We're going to have three modules. I will be teaching one on additive manufacturing. I have up here some additive manufacturing parts. These are things that I made by high energy electron beam about 25 years ago. That's made out of a, that was supposed to be a way for the US Navy to build propellers, because that's a manganese aluminum bronze, which is what they build propellers out of. This is a piece of stainless steel, and you can see the defects that form. This is a piece of Inconel, okay? Those are old things that we made 25 years ago. Today, there's a company called Digital Alloys that has developed a high-speed process to, and this is a titanium part, and they're making these types of parts, which is just a rod of titanium. Be careful, it looks like the World Trade Center if you stand it on end, um, and it might collapse. Anyway, um, in any case, they're making them for Boeing, and Boeing wants them to make a few thousand so they can qualify them for parts. Now they're gonna machine it into a special part. If you go down the hall here, I stole these from Mike Tarkanian, sent him an email that I had stolen them. These were demos from Desktop Metals, which is the startup, which is just literally a quarter mile down the road from De Digital Alloys that makes that, and they use a powder bed process. And that is the Institute. The problem with the powder bread process, it's 50% void, and so it shrinks by 50% when you densify it. The problem with that is it leaves behind defects. So if you look on that broken piece, you'll see the defects. In any case, there's a guy at Digital Alloys who wrote 10 blogs, which are going to be your text for my part of the course. And he will come in at the end of September, and we'll have him talk to you, okay? Um, but also, in, if you watch Eager Spring 2016 Structural Materials Lecture 2 Out of 2 on YouTube, which if you go to my website, there'll be a link. You don't have to watch the introduction again for the first six and a half minutes, but you watch that. MIT Technology Review asked me two weeks before class, why don't we do uh, additive manufacturing of metals? And I talked to him for two hours about, well, we have been. We've been doing it for 100 years. But we don't because there are a lot of technical problems. You can only do it in certain cases. So this course is going to be what's good about additive manufacturing, what's bad about additive manufacturing. And it re is it really going to be this great promise of new manufacturing of the future? The bottom line is no, it won't. Okay, but it does have some niche af applications. Um, innovation versus technical startups. Uh, Simone Belmar has started a company that does non-destructive testing to 
measure the strength of pipelines. We have a half million miles of pipelines in this country, and the federal government wants to know if they're worth keeping in service after 50 years. That's a probably a trillion dollar investment that the oil companies and others have, and they don't want to lose their investment because the federal government deregulates them, okay? Uh, so he's going to talk about the things he's learned in starting that company, which is starting to be successful. And Dr. Holman, Brian, you want to talk about what you're going to talk about? Um, so my module is going to be more on field inspection techniques um, for whether it's rail, maritime, nuclear power plants, advanced. The techniques are going to be dependent um, on the material you're expecting. So even aerospace, the new, new airplanes have more composites in them. So how you would inspect for delamination versus a weld failure depends on the size of the flaw you need to find uh, and how much penetration depth you need. So my module is really related towards practical applications and it discusses new techniques that were discussed in my thesis that are now being Incorporated into the industry for inspection. So, if you want to learn about how to inspect things, um, Brian's going to talk about the latest and greatest techniques. Uh, the schedule. So, this is on Stellar, but to, yesterday was, or Monday was Labor Day, yesterday was Registration Day. Um, I'm giving you the intro today. Brian will be giving his first lecture tomorrow. Uh, Simone Belmar will be here on Friday. And oops, um, Simone will be doing Monday. I'll be doing two lectures, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, on uh, 3D printing, uh, additive manufacturing. Brian will do a couple. Um, I would suggest if you're, if you want to focus on any one of these, for mine, you go to that uh, spring of 2015 lecture, second lecture on structural materials and watch that hour. That would give you a, a background. And then there's also on the, on the web, or on the Stellar, there's the list of the, the 10 blogs. And these are just written blogs about things like the economics of metal additive manufacturing. And he talks about, like, there's 20 different process, processes that are out there. And he contrasts and compares them. I think it's, it's a fairly, I think it's a fair assessment, okay, of what's out there. Okay, I get question, asked questions all the time about additive manufacturing. So I decided, well, I might as well, since Alex put this together in the past year, we might as well do a module. And then here's the rest of the schedule through, and it turns out we'll finish up on the last day of September, if all goes well. We don't have snowstorms or anything else, okay? And then, um, uh, I don't know if this, this one's probably not necessary. I'll leave it up to you could read it. Any questions? So come to class, ask questions. I would rather answer your question than give a lecture. Okay, I'm more in now recitation mode. I like pass around touchy feelies. There are other things on Stellar right now. If you want to read things, there's an article that I wrote about six weeks after the World Trade Center collapsed. And I was so sick of reading things in the paper that were just outright wrong, okay, about the collapse of the World Trade Center. People said, oh, the fire was so hot it melted the steel. If, we, if you could melt steel that easily, we didn't need Henry Bessemer in the 1860s to teach us how to melt steel, okay? You don't melt steel in any type of building fire. I mean, I've seen oil rigs where you have 60 foot flame, I can show you a video actually, of a 60 foot flame in an oil rig, and the thing lasts for hours. And finally it collapses, not because the steel melted, because it just got so hot, so weak, it just falls over, like cooked spaghetti, okay? So what happened is, um, there's another professor who was asked to write an article by a journal editor, journal of metals editor, and he said, ask Tom Eager. So I took it on and I wrote this article. And I sometimes describe it as what you can say about something when you know nothing about the subject. Okay? This has become, out of hundreds of publications, the most referenced publication 
I've ever written. It took three hours of my time to research it and write it, okay? And it became, for nine years, if you Google WTC collapse, I was the number one hit. Everybody was reading this. I'd go to Washington, and all of a sudden, I was the expert in, two th in the fall of 2000. Actually, it didn't come out until December. But in 2002, early 2002, people in Washington considered me the expert on the WTC collapse. I'd spent three hours studying it. Hmm. Okay, and then uh, starting about that same time, the truthers, they thought, uh, anybody know what the truthers are? 18% of this country believe that the government brought down the World Trade Center towers. It's a conspiracy. And at first they said, Eager's paper is wrong because he says you can't melt steel. Any firefighter who's ever been to a fire knows that you don't melt steel in a fire. You didn't need me to say that. But they said Eager's an idiot. And then about three years later, they actually wrote a book, which I think I have somewhere in my office, where it said Eager's an idiot because the fire only got to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Excuse me? You can't even cook a good pizza in that fire? And so I, when I was teaching thermo at the time, I gave that that book, like two or three pages of some calculation. The person didn't put his name on the chapter, which is good. He would have gotten an F in my thermo course. And he calculated heat transfer into the concrete slab, and he determined that there was not going to be enough heat to get that concrete slab to more than 500 degrees. Well, that's because he didn't think about thermal conductivity and in an hour's time, you can't heat four inches of concrete. You only get surface heating. Okay, but they didn't realize that. Okay. So I, I used to hand it out and said, any student who can figure out what the error is in this calculation can get a pass on the first homework assignment. And actually, the, there were only three or four students who took the challenge, but all of them figured it out. Okay. The error was not that hard to fi find. Anyway, there's a number of articles. If, you, if you're interested in structural materials, there's an article I wrote for a National Research Council Committee on Materials Research for the 21st Century, and I disagreed with almost everybody on the committee, and so they put my uh, four pages as an appendix at the end. But what I did is I took my structural materials course, and I took the notes home, and I outlined the entire course in four pages. So if you want to know what I'm going to say about structural materials, it's right here in four pages. Okay. Uh, there's some other things in here, like Tufta talks about PowerPoint. Okay. I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, although I used it. But he hates PowerPoint. But if you want to read the Gettysburg Address in seven PowerPoints, it's in here. Okay. And it goes in bullet form. Not on agenda, dedicate, consecrate, hallow, add or detract, not, not note or remember what we say. I mean, you can take a great piece of American prose and turn it into pure, pure drivel with PowerPoint. Okay? That was when I used to have the students. I used to have communication requirement as part of this course, but it got to be too many students, and so we don't do it anymore. So there are some sort of fun things in there. Uh, I don't remember if I still have the Air Force squawks, but they may be in there. So any other, any questions? I'm always better if you ask me questions. Anyway, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, you, you're lecturing tomorrow. Yeah. Just one, uh, one word for the papers. So from previous years, do not cite Wikipedia. Um, I'll put some general guidelines. The only way you're really going to get nailed in this course, and we, I've seen the course basically come directly from something I've already been published. So don't use Wikipedia, put it in your own words, and cite your citing the Plagiarism is not encouraged. And Brian's excellent at figuring it out.